OK, so here's the problem. I've previously written some quite complicated class hierarchies for an adventure game. If you haven't watched that series, follow the link down below and I'll show you how to create games using either Java or C Sharp, both of which are object-oriented languages. Now, recently someone asked me how an adventure game might be written in a language without object orientation. Well, it seemed a good question, so I thought I'd see how long it would take me to write a simple game in Go. I spent a couple of afternoons on that problem, and this is what I came up with. It's a simple game with a few locations or rooms. The player can enter commands to move from one room to another. Some rooms contain treasures, and the player can take uh, treasures and drop them in other rooms. Now, this is quite a small game, but even so, it has most of the basic features that you need to build a big and complicated game, a traditional sort of text adventure. Now, let me say at the outset that I've previously not programmed in Go, so I've had to learn this language as I've been writing it. Now, my aim has been to make my Go program as similar as I can to the games that I wrote in C Sharp and Java. Experienced Go programmers will no doubt think of all kinds of slicker and better ways to do what I've done here. But in my defence, I should say that it's only taken me a few hours to write this, and I'm really pretty pleased with just how much functionality I've already been able to build into my game. Now, the Go language doesn't have classes or inheritance. My C Sharp and Java games have dense class hierarchies. You can see an example here. This is a game that I wrote in C Sharp. And in those languages, I can have one type of object descending from another type. So that, for example, here in C Sharp, I've got the base class thing, and that has, amongst other things, a name and a description. And then I've declared a thing holder, that's a thing that can hold collections of other things, and that inherits the name and description from thing, and then another class inherits all that from thing holder, that's the actor class, and similarly a room class, and that also inherits from thing holder. So there I've got quite a already quite a, a deep class hierarchy. Now in my Go project, let's have a look at the Go code. Well, you can see that just as in my C Sharp and Java games, I have a thing. This is the definition of thing, and it's got a name and a description. And if I look at these other classes, I've got treasure, and the treasure uh, has access to the thing's name and description, and so does the room, as you can see here. And in fact, some of these data types also have dedicated functions that work pretty much like the methods in my C Sharp and Java code, and yet it's all without classes or inheritance. So how can that be? Well, that's what I plan to show you next. The first thing to notice is that I've used structs instead of classes to store the data fields. Now, in an object-oriented language, the thing class would be the base class from which the other classes descend. In Go, the thing struct is going to be kind of the base struct. So how can other structs inherit name and description? Well, the short answer is they can't. But what they can do is they can include the th thing struct as a field. And that's what the treasure and the room uh, uh, structs have done here. Now I keep wanting to call them classes because I'm thinking about this in an object-oriented way, but strictly speaking this is not inheritance, it's including the thing as a field. So now these classes have access to the name and description that was defined in thing, just as in my Java and uh, C Sharp projects the classes would inherit the name and description. And if you go now into the, for example, the room struct, you can see now that it's added on extra fields. These are integer fields, NSWE, for the directions, the exits from the room. And similarly, if I look at treasure, uh, it includes a thing field to access name and description, but it adds on the takeable field. This is a, a Boolean and a takeable treasure is one like a ring, whereas a, a tree or some other fixed item would not be takeable. You can't go around and just take a, a tree. 
So you can see that even without object orientation, I've been able to create something fairly quickly that resembles a class hierarchy. In a class hierarchy, one class inherits the features of another class. Here, one struct includes the features of another struct. But what about methods? In an object-oriented language, methods are functions that are bound into objects, so they act upon the data related to that object. I can't put methods inside structs in Go, so does that mean I've run into a barrier? No, not at all. Let's have a look at the room struct here for an example. Now it turns out that Go lets me create functions that are typed to operate on specific data types. So for example, this one here is typed to operate on a room, on a room object. And uh, let's have a look, this one down here, well, this one, uh, which modifies the room's list of treasures, that's typed to operate on a pointer to a room object, and that's indicated by this asterisk here. So now, even though this is not an object-oriented language and I don't formally have a class hierarchy, the end result is very similar to object-oriented code, in which I do have a class hierarchy with one class inheriting from another class and functions or methods that are associated with those classes. Anyway, let me finish by quickly scrolling through all my code so that you can see exactly what I've done. Now, here is the main.go file, the startup of the program, if you like. Uh, and here, it, if you look down here, you can see that it defines a map of pointers, a game map here, uh, which are pointers to room objects. And it has a player, uh, which is defined by the actor struct. Now here, the init game, let me just widen this window a bit so you can see it a bit more easily. The uh, init game function up here, uh, that creates the player struct and the various room structs creates and initializes them. Uh, it adds rooms to the game map, that's down here and then it adds treasures to the rooms. And finally, right down at the bottom, it sets the uh, player's position to zero, so the player starts off in the room with index zero in the game map. And down here, if I go right down the bottom here, we find the main loop. So here is the main function, and uh, it has a debug section up here, which I've just got a Boolean, which I can turn on or off to print some debugging information, which is uh, useful for me when I'm developing the game. Uh, this just prints details of the map uh, when the debug variable is true. When I'm playing the game, then I, I set that to false. And down here, uh, it's got this main loop and it reads the string and trims it and defines it, divides it into words and then it runs the program. So the key features here, the things to look out for, really are this call to init game. This is a function that creates and initializes the map, the treasures and so on. Uh, then after that debug section, we've got the main loop down here. Uh, two word array is what uh, divides up the input into individual strings and then it carries on running until the input uh, is Q, that is until the user enters Q to quit. And the main part of the game runner, if you like, is this do command function. Uh, I pass the words to that, words that's a a slice, and that's a kind of array in Go. So I pass those words in this sort of array to the do command function, and that function returns a string, which is what's then displayed on the uh, command line. So let's look at do command. This has a switch case statement uh, that calls functions to process either one word or two word commands and that's the maximum number of words permitted in this very simple game. So if I go up to one word command, 
that's this function up here. Well, this has another switch case uh, st statement. Oh, by the way, uh, notice that unlike in C and many C-like languages, you don't have to break explicitly when a case is matched. If a direction, N, S, W, or E was entered, then the room at that index, at the index given by the game player's pause value, is set to the exit, which is an integer value that indicates an exit into the game map, or minus one if there is no exit in that direction. So um, no breaks after these case uh, statements. And if I was entered, you can see that here, then the show inventory function is called to show a list of treasures owned by the player. And if L was entered, that's a shorthand for the look command. And so the look method uh, or the look function executes to show a description of the current room. And finally, if the player has moved, then this code down here sets the player's position to the exit, the exit that was determined by the code earlier in the function. And if there was no exit, then that is minus one. So the movement does not occur and the string no exit will then be uh, returned and displayed. Let's have a look at two word command. So this is sent two words uh, as arguments. And here take and drop are the only two word commands that I've implemented so far, though of course you could write extra commands later on. Now, if the first word, that's the verb, is take or drop, then the appropriate function is called and the second word, that's the name of an object, is passed to that function. So let's have a look at a drop. So this iterates over a range of treasures in the player's list of treasures for i to the range, that is from the start to the end of the list. If the name specified matches the name of one of the treasures, then it's transferred from the player's list of treasures to the list of treasures in the current room. That is the room at the index given by the player's position. Notice that I've passed the addresses of these two lists. That's the ampersand uh, here. And take, well, that's very similar to drop. So if I go and have a look at the take command, uh, the only difference here is that the treasure is transferred from the room collection to the player collection rather than the other way around. Now, just to be sure that you've seen exactly what I've done, I'm quickly going to go through this main.go code file and all the other files in my project. So here's the package statement as required by Go, imports of various other files it uses. So this is where the rooms are set up, they are initialized in init game. Uh, look function, take, I've already explained. So I'll just scroll so you can see that. Pause the video, of course, at any point if you want to take a closer look at this code, but I'm quickly going through the whole lot so that nothing is hidden from you. This is all in the main.go file. Right, now let's turn to some of the other code in the project. In Visual Studio Code, show the explorer so you can see the various files that I've got in this project up here. Let's start with thing.go. This defines the base struct, very simple, it just contains two strings. Uh, actor. Um, this defines the player. It defines an int field, uh, pause, uh, to store the player's location and a list of treasures. The thing field includes the thing struct. And then uh, down here you can see I've got a function list inventory. Again, let me just scroll it so you can see all of what this does. So this just, um, this can be called from an actor struct. You can see that's been typed to actor and much as my C sharp and Java code uh, in, in th those I would call a method for an actor object. Well, this is associated, this function is associated with an actor struct. And this function just returns a formatted string of the treasures. 
And when I want to add a new treasure to the list of treasures owned by the player, uh, then I call the add treasure function here. And this is typed to an actor pointer so that the actual object is modified, not just a copy. Let's turn to room. So this is my room struct. And this has four ints to define the exits, plus a treasure list, that's the treasures in any given room. And just like the actor, it includes thing. That's kind of like the, the base object or struct of this, uh, of this series of, of, of um, game. I'm quite using the term object, you know what I mean. It's, it's the objects in the game. Right, so the describe function down here describes, it returns a description of the room. Now remember these here, name and description, those are actually fields defined in the thing object, even though it's called here from uh, the describe function associated with room. So again, that's another way in which it works. It works in a way that I can think of very, very much as I'd expect uh, the code to work in, in say, C Sharp or Java. And then here it goes and it adds on a, the descriptions of the treasures. So it has a for loop for I, uh, and it goes through the range of treasures in the room. Now, one thing you might notice here, if I go down further, I've got this add treasure function and there's a small amount of duplication here in the code of room and actor because I've got the same, effectively the same function declined for, uh, defined for both of them. Now later on I may define an intermediate struct called something like list holder. If you remember I showed you that earlier on in the C sharp code where I have a thing holder which descends from thing and thing holder just takes care of um, a thing, any sort of thing that has a list of other things. So I might think of doing that in my Go game to avoid that duplication. Now let's have a look at treasure. Well, this is pretty straightforward. It's just got, again, it, it has name and description, which is taken from the thing uh, struct. And then it just has this function down here, describe, uh, which describes the treasure. Oh, one other thing is I've got two more files that contain utility functions. So I've got them here in libs, I've got listlib, and that just has some utility functions to remove treasures from a list or a slice and to add treasures and transfer a treasure. And then I've got another utility function uh, in my uh, sort of string library, str lib, and that I just use a regular expression here. You don't need to understand regular expressions, but it has a regular expression to split a string into words divided by spaces or the other punctuation marks which I've uh, shown here. So you can see that I've written a fairly complex program pretty quickly without all that much code really. Now, as I said, this is not intended to be a tutorial on the Go language. There are lots of those around if you need them. Now, this was more of an experiment to see how I could, in a sense, mimic an object-oriented approach to creating hierarchies of related objects. So if you want to follow my series on writing adventure games, but you want to adapt the techniques I show to work in some other language, well, I hope this video has given you some ideas. I've shown you how I adapted code I wrote in C-sharp and Java to work in a very different language, that's Go. But you could equally well write similar programs in Python, Ruby, Rust, or whatever other language. If anyone's interested, I might think about writing a more complete game in Go or some other language later on. If you've got any thoughts or ideas on that, please leave a comment down below. And to be sure you don't miss out on any of my future videos, be sure to subscribe to my channel and click that bell. And I'll see you again soon.